This video will be an introduction to hematology, which is the study of blood and blood disorders. We'll look at the composition of blood, we'll look at a lab test that's called a hematocrit, and we'll study differential white blood cell counts. So here we have red blood cells, and here's a couple of white blood cells, and here's some whole blood here. Whole blood is the blood that is flowing through your veins and arteries. So this would be whole blood taken from an individual. Then that centrifuge that's spun and the heavier elements go to the bottom. That would be the red blood cells and also the white blood cells and platelets. And then we have this watery straw colored clear fluid called plasma. So the average adult has about five liters of blood. That, of course, varies with gender and with size. Larger men have more blood volume. So remember these down here are called the formed elements. The formed elements are mostly red blood cells. Less than 1% are white blood cells and platelets. And the formed elements account for 45% of blood by volume. The other part, the other 55, is plasma. That's this part. Remember, this is broken down by volume, not by mass. Hematocrit, that's that lab um, test that I mentioned. That's the percentage of red blood cells by volume. So remember, when this is spun down, it spins out into about 45% by volume red blood cells. So a normal hematocrit is 45%. If a hematocrit is lower than that, that indicates anemia. Uh, maybe an iron deficiency. If hematocrit is higher than that, that might be an indication of dehydration or other uh, blood disorders. All right, there's a lot going on here, but we're going to take it slow. So we have whole blood. In whole blood, we saw it can be spun down into what's called the formed elements, which includes mostly red blood cells and a little bit of platelets and a little bit of white blood cells. And then the other 55% is the blood plasma. We have electrolytes, water, proteins, waste, nutrients, and gases. We'll look at that all later briefly. But let's focus on the cells here, on these formed elements. Notice there's five types of white blood cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. We'll learn how to identify those under a microscope. So let's look at the formed elements more carefully. First, red blood cells. Red blood cells are called erythrocytes. They have a biconcave disc type shape. So it's almost like a Frisbee in the sense it's like concave on both sides. This allows for um, oxygen to be carried closer to the hemoglobin, also increases surface area. And that biconcave shape gives, gives the red blood cell flexibility as it's traveling through um, the capillaries. Remember what these red blood cells do is they, they transport blood and carbon dioxide to and from body tissues. When the erythrocyte has oxygen attached to it, it's called oxyhemoglobin. And when it has given up the oxygen, it's called deoxyhemoglobin. Red blood cells live for about three months. After that time, they're broken down in the liver and in the spleen by macrophages. Now, you've already learned about macrophages. Macrophages, remember, are those um, phagocytizing cells or the cells that eat. So the macrophages will break down the red blood cells by chewing them up in the liver and the spleen. So here's a, a good sectional view where you can see the, the biconcavity there. So in this microscope slide, uh, these two are white blood cells, and the rest of these are the erythrocytes or the red blood cells. Now let's look at the white blood cells. The white blood cells are called leukocytes. We have two main kinds. We have the granulocytes, and then we have the agranulocytes. The granulocytes have these granular cytoplasmic, like inclusions, if you will. So those, what those are is their secretory vesicles, just like we saw with the mast cell. Um, the, the neutrophil, the eosinophil, and the basophil, those are the three leukocytes that are considered granulocytes. So this dark purple is a nucleus. And then all these purple little dots, those are all the granules. So that's the stuff that can be secreted from the cell, like heparin um, and other enzymes. And then the agranulocytes do not have those granules in the cytoplasm. That would be the monocyte and the lymphocyte. So right here we have, I think it's a monocyte it looks like. So the cytoplasm is less granular. 
Hemopoiesis is the production of red and white blood cells in addition to platelets. And that takes place in the red marrow of long bones. Remember at the end of the long bones, we called those the epiphyses. Proximal and distal epiphyses, we had um, red marrow. And in the red marrow, that's where these hemopoietic stem cells, remember stem cells can differentiate into other types of cells. These differentiate and go through a seemingly endless series of immature blood cells until eventually we're left with erythrocytes and then the granulocytes and the agranulocytes. So the ones that are circled here are the ones, are the white blood cells that we need to um, be responsible for knowing. So all this stuff we don't need to know, but it's nice to see once. So these differentiate into red blood cells and the white blood cells. All right, let's look at neutrophils first. Neutrophils are by far the most abundant. Neutrophils make up about 54 to 62% of the white blood cells. And those are cells that are involved with um, phagocytosis. They're sort of like first responders. They can respond within minutes to the site of an injury. Um, or if there's bacterial cells, um, they'll begin eating those cells up right away. Way to spot a neutrophil. I think this gets the name um, neutro, as in like neutral, because it doesn't stain real dark purple, nor does it stain real dark red. So let's look at um, these four here. This is from the same website, so <clears throat> um, similar staining. So you can see that the nuclei, or, or the, the nucleus rather, we'll call it, um, is dark purple, but the cytoplasm is sort of that neutral color, not really red, not really purple. This is another one. This is from a different website, a different stain. And this is from your laboratory manual. Here's three different neutrophils. This is an immature one. It has a C shape to it. It's called banded. And then oftentimes we see neutrophils have these multiple lobed nuclei. So it might look like any one of these or even slightly different from these. All right, let's look at the eosinophils next. The eosinophils are kind of like a mast cell in the sense that they're involved with um, allergy and asthma. And what they do is they fight multicellular pathogens like parasitic worms. So the neutrophils we saw, if you have a high neutrophil count, you might likely have a bacterial infection. If your eosinophil count is high, you might be suffering from a larger um, parasite like a worm. So you don't see a lot of eosinophils. Um, eosinophil means, phil means like loving, and then eosin is one of the stains that stains red. So the cytoplasm is oftentimes stained red. You can see here it's it's reddish, and here it's certainly reddish. So to me, an eosinophil and a neutrophil look very similar. One of the distinctions is that the cytoplasm is more red on an eosinophil. Then the basophil. A basophil is very rare. It's less than 1%, and that's involved in allergic reactions. Asthma, inflammation produces histamine or histamine and heparin. You probably have heard that before. That's because it's just like the mast cell. Basically, a basophil is a mast cell in the blood. And when a basophil is in um, peripheral tissues, like connective tissue, it's, it's more like called a mast cell. But for our purposes, they're basically the same thing. They're very similar. These granules that are in there, if this degranulates or, or sort of releases its it's, it's secretory vesicles or these granules. This opens up, and then what spills out is heparin and histamine. Remember, histamine is involved with the immune response, and heparin is like, kind of like a blood thinner. The way to spot a basophil, if you come across one, they're pretty neat looking. Um, but I always remember blue basophil. I remember the alliteration. It's actually more purple than blue. But notice that the granules inside here are really deep purple. In fact, they're stained so deeply that the nucleus is obscured. Sometimes you don't even see it. So here we don't see the nucleus at all, nor do we do here. And here are three pictures from your lab manual. You can see the nucleus, a shadow of it sort of behind all the granules. So if you find a base of fill, that's it's a rare find. All right, now we're going to move on to the agranulocytes. First one's the monocyte. The monocyte, 3 to 
of the white blood cells. It's the largest of the white blood cells. It's very big. Notice how large it is compared to these red blood cells. It's two to three times larger. And a monocyte is specialized for phagocytosis of pathogens and dead or damaged cells. And when a monocyte migrates into peripheral tissues, it's called a macrophage. And you already know what a macrophage is. We've seen that. The macrophage is the cell that phagocytizes or eats other cells. One of the things that the monocyte or macrophage does is it chews up the red blood cells. Remember we said they live for about three months and then they get chewed up by the macrophages and the monocytes that persist in the liver and spleen. So the monocyte, first way to spot it is it's large compared to the red blood cells, but often has this lobed nucleus. So here we are, we can see it's got that C-shaped. And the last one is a lymphocyte. A lymphocyte counts for about 25 to 33%. It's got a round nucleus. See that? And oftentimes the nucleus occupies most of the volume of the cell. So we just see like a small band of cytoplasm around the nucleus. And what the lymphocyte does, there's two kinds. We got the B cell and the T cell. The B cells, those generate um, antibodies. And then those antibodies will bind to and destroy, um, you know, the foreign antigens or the foreign cells. And we also have these T cells. These T cells destroy cells that have been infected with a virus. We're not going to differentiate between the B and the T cell. There's no way for me to do that under a scope, at least. But notice um, the characteristics. They're not very large. They're only slightly larger than the red blood cells, rounded nucleus and then not a whole lot of cytoplasm, just a thin band of cytoplasm. Unfortunately, um, a, larger monos a larger lymphocyte looks very similar to a monocyte. And then here's your laboratory manuals, three examples of lymphocyte. And the last formed element we're gonna look like it is a platelet. A platelet sometimes go by the name of thrombocyte. Site's a little misleading because you'd think it was a cell, but a platelet's not really a cell, it's just like a cell fragment but that also develops in the bone too. And if a platelet comes in contact with a collagen fiber, and the way it might come in contact with the collagen fiber is if one of the capillaries or vessels was um, has ruptured, then these platelets come in contact with the connective tissue that's just below or just deep to um, the epithelium of that blood vessel. So when they come in contact with that connective tissue, they bump into the collagen fibers and then these platelets sort of aggregate around these um, collagen fibers and they form a plug and that plug prevents blood loss. So here we are. Um, here's a tear in the epithelium. These little blue things are platelets. These platelets are gonna come in contact with these collagen fibers. And as they come in contact with the collagen fibers, they aggravate, not aggravate, they aggregate rather, and they create this plug. So platelets, those are easy to spot. They're very tiny, much smaller than the red blood cell. And sometimes we see them in clumps. Other times we see them sort of separate, but close together. And other times we see them just like singular platelets sort of spaced out. So in review, here's what we've got. Whole blood. If we centrifuge whole blood, we can split it into formed elements, which is 45%. That's called the hematocrit because it's mostly red blood cells. And then we have the plasma. In the formed elements, we have platelets, red blood cells, and white blood cells. And then we have five types of white blood cells. We have the granulocytes. Notice they all end in fill, neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil. And then we have the agranulocytes, which end in site, monocyte and lymphocyte. And then the plasma. The plasma's got a lot going on, but it's mostly just water and protein. There are, of course, electrolytes like sodium and potassium and calcium waste products like urea from the breakdown of protein. We have vitamins in the blood and hormones in the blood and also gases that are being exchanged, specifically oxygen and carbon dioxide. There's nitrogen too, because our air that we breathe is mostly nitrogen. But let's look at the protein. There's three proteins, well, there's a lot of proteins, but these are the three of significance. We got L, or for significance for us, we have albumins, globulins, and fibrogen. Albumins, make up 60% of blood protein by weight. That helps maintain colloidal osmotic pressure, 
what that means, you may remember from bio or chem. Um, osmotic pressure is, or osmosis is the diffusion of water. So if we have lots of blood protein called albumin, um, what that does, it creates osmotic pressure and it keeps, keeps the fluid or the liquid in the blood. If for some reason the liver is not creating albumin and we're low on albumin, then water tends to leak out of the blood into the peripheral tissues, causing swelling. We have these globulins, we have alpha, beta, gamma. The alpha and beta transport lipids and fat-soluble vitamins. And the gamma globulins are a type of antibody. And lastly, we have um, fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is the smallest fraction, it's only 4%. It plays a kind of cool role. It's important in blood coagulation. So fibrinogen, under the right conditions, there's a cascading of events, and one of them is fibrinogen gets converted. This fibrinogen is soluble in the blood. It's floating around, but then it can get converted to what's called fibrin, and fibrin are these thin fibers, and these thin fibers will form around um, damaged tissue, like a break in the vessel, and then when this fibrin forms, it be, it's, that's the first signs of a clot, because you get these red blood cells that get caught up in the web of fibrin.